Hello, this is the American Medical Association's COVID-19 update. Today, we have the second episode of a special two-part series discussing the recent Pfizer vaccine authorization and what physicians and patients need to know. We return to our conversation with Dr. Sandra Freihofer, an AMA trustee and the AMA liaison to the CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, or ACIP, in Atlanta. Dr. Marcus Plesha, Chief Medical Officer of the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, or ASTO, in Atlanta. Dr. Plesha is ASTO's liaison to ACIP. And Shannon Curtis, the AMA's Assistant Director, Federal Affairs in Alexandria, Virginia. I'm Todd Unger, AMA's Chief Experience Officer in Chicago. Dr. Plesha, let's keep uh, you know digging on this particular topic uh, and talk about prioritization. You know, who is going to receive the vaccine first? And can you give a little background on how these allocation recommendations were determined? Yes. So, you know, to begin with, there's not enough vaccine for everybody in the country. We're still, the companies are still in the process of making it. And we have the Pfizer vaccine right now, hopefully close behind that, we'll have the Moderna vaccine. And they're gearing up production. But to begin with, there's a limited number of doses. And so one of the roles of the ACIP is to provide recommendations about how to prioritize who gets the dose when. The first group, and they, they've divided into phases, phase 1A, 1B, and 1C, and then there'll be a phase two and maybe a phase three. So phase 1A is the group that we're working with right now, and that's healthcare workers and people who live in long-term care facilities. There's about 20 million healthcare workers in the United States. There's about 3 million people who work in long-term care facilities. And I think that's a, that's a pretty good matchup because we do think that over the next few months, we should pretty quickly get to where we've got 20, 25 million doses of the vaccine. After that, we, we will move to the next phase. And that's what the ACIP is still deliberating and fi finalizing on. There are two groups being considered to come next up. One would be essential workers. And essential workers are the people out there, you know, every day going out and, and providing essential services. Healthcare workers are essential workers, but healthcare workers are you know, at, at the very front because we are dealing with people who are sick. Um, but there are, there are many other essential workers, and that's one group that's gonna be high on the prioritization. And right now, that group seems to be the focus for 1B. And then the other group is people who are at particular risk if they contract COVID. So people who are older or people who have com comorbid conditions. And the, the ACIP is working through, uh, you know, how to, how, which group to put first. A couple of things that have come into the conversation about essential workers. I mean, first of all, essential workers are important from an infection control point of view. They, they are out in public. They have no choice but to go into their jobs and they're interacting. And so that's how, that's how get COVID gets passed from person to person. If we can immunize them, we can cut down the amount on the amount of infection. But equally important with the ACIP is this issue of equity. And, and we've seen such inequities with COVID so far with people of color and people who are low income being far more likely to get the disease, and being far more likely to get very sick and even to die. So what we found is amongst essential workers, there are a lot of people who are in racial and ethnic uh, minority communities or from, from low income brackets. And so by really reaching out to essential workers and providing them a higher priority, it's an intervention we could make that could help maybe turn around some of the inequities we've been seeing so far. And the ACIP has really been grappling with that and trying mm -hmm. to think about, uh, you know, how to build that equity piece in so that, so that we can do this in a fair way, as well as doing it in a very effective way. Do you have any sense of like that kind of phase one you know, what, what are we looking at in terms of timing? Uh, you know, that's <laughs> that's what we'll, we'll get a sense as they roll out the vaccine, kind of where, um, you know, how long it does take to get a substantial supply. Um, you know, I think phase one is, is going to roll out over the next month or two. I mean, I, I want to be optimistic and say we can get through that in a month or so. But, you know, I, I think we also need to be realistic. It might take a couple months to really get that sorted out. Then we move into phase one, I'm sorry, phase, that's phase 1A. Phase 1B, which is probably going to be a, a, a contingent from the essential workers group and maybe some people who are in older age categories. 
you know, that group can be anywhere, depending on, on how they divide it up, that group could be anywhere from 30 to 40 million people. Or if you look at all essential workers, that's almost 100 million people. Either way, it's going to take a little bit of time to work through phase 1B. And then when we get to phase 1C, uh, if that's people who have comorbid conditions or who are older, there are almost 100 million people in that group. And so it, it'll take a little while to get through 1C. And when you think about it, once you've done 1A, 1B, and 1C, you've actually gotten a pretty good portion of the American population. Then we'll move into phase two. I, I think by the time we get into late 1B, 1C, we're going to see manufacturing really picking up. Maybe we'll even have a couple of other vir uh, vaccine candidates out there. I think the public will start to see this moving faster and, and the opportunity to get vaccinated be much closer at hand. Well, I'm sure that uh, patients have a lot of questions and doctors' phones are probably ringing off the hook at this point. Uh, Ms. Curtis, why don't you tell us a little bit about what physicians need to know about counseling patients about the vaccine and any AMA resources that might help them sort through all of that information? Sure. Um, you know, we understand there's a lot of questions um, and, you know, in some cases, rightfully so. Uh, this is a little bit of a new process that I don't think that a, a lot of physicians and patients are, are used to seeing. Uh, you know, unprecedented pandemic, the use of this emergency use authorization pathway for a lot of tests and vaccines and things like that. Um, folks have a lot of questions, and you know, we know that vaccine hesitancy is is high and, and growing with vaccines generally. And it's probably going to be relatively high um, with this vaccine in particular, just given the situation. Um, because of that, you know, we want physicians uh, to know as much as they possibly can about this vaccine, about the process. We want them to be as educated as possible so they can in turn help educate their patients when they undoubtedly get the flood of questions that we know are likely coming down the pike here. So the AMA has been very committed um, to providing as many educational opportunities and materials as we can, both for physicians and patients. Uh, we have developed a COVID-19 vaccine resource center that's available on the AMA webpage and that will have links to a number of resources, um, both those that the AMA has created like FAQs and inpatient facing materials and then links um, to educational resources from places like the FDA and the CDC. And um, one thing I do want to make everybody aware of that I think is going to be really important for physicians is that the AMA has partnered with FDA and CDC over the last few months and will continue that partnership over coming months um, to do a series of educational webinars um, that really uh, help explain the process um, that FDA went through, that CDC is going through, that really is a deeper dive into the safety and efficacy data, to the distribution and prioritization and work that's going on at CDC. And those webinars have been great. They featured leaders from FDA, um, from CDC, as well as uh, we'll feature some of our physician leaders as well. So we really encourage physicians to check those out. The links are available on our website, just a wealth of background information so everybody can be up to speed and we can hopefully reduce any vaccine hesitancy and answer those questions that are out there. Dr. Freihofer, talk to us about, you know, how you're viewing this within the context of your own practice and what advice you would give physicians. Well, as Shannon mentioned, you know, patients have a lot of questions. And when counseling patients about vaccination, it's so important to be open, honest, and transparent because this builds confidence and trust. And that's something that's very important right now, especially when we have people that are might be a little nervous about the vaccine. Now, it's also honesty is, is very important. And getting this particular vaccine is not going to be a walk in the park. Uh, patients uh, will probably know they've had a vaccine, even uh, because they'll feel it. Uh, but for, and for full protection, you have to have that second dose. So we have to make sure that patients know what to expect. Uh, they should expect some mild to moderate local and systemic reactions, pain, swelling at the injection site, you know, which we see with most vaccines. But they also might expect to experience a little fever, fatigue, headache, chills, muscle aches, joint aches. You might not feel like going to work the next day after you get vaccinated. So, you know, it might be a good idea to get back the vaccine before your day off or even better um, before your weekend off. And you do have to have two doses. 
the symptoms are usually worse after the second dose, and they're usually worse and younger as compared to older patients. But you can think of these symptoms as a sign that the vaccine is working. So that's a way to make feeling bad feeling really good. And the good news is that the symptoms seem to resolve within one to two days. The CDC is putting together a toolkit for healthcare providers, and it will have some guidance and helping to decide if your symptoms that you're experiencing are due to COVID or a side effect of the vaccination and what to do and how to evaluate those symptoms. And if you do have an active case of COVID, you need to hold off on getting the vaccine. You need to wait until you've recovered. CDC also says if you've had a known exposure, you should wait until after your quarantine is over to get vaccinated. That way you won't risk exposing healthcare providers and others that you might, have in con might come in contact with. Dr. Plesha, any other thoughts on this particular topic? Yeah, um, a couple of things. First of all, you know, it, it's very exciting that, that we have this vaccine. It's, it's you know, a, a wonder of science. And it finally, I think, gives us all, you know, a, a, a sense of positivity that we're finally going to break away from this. But there are a couple of things I think people need to keep in mind in addition to the vaccine. The vaccine is one tool in the toolkit that we have right now. Another thing to not lose sight of is if you do get sick with COVID before you've had a chance to get the vaccine, and if you have medical or age conditions that put you at higher risk, you should seriously consider reaching out to your medical provider about maybe having access to monoclonal antibody treatments. These are, these are very promising treatments that can really help make sure that people who might be a little more frail or at risk uh, can, can, won't go on to have serious uh, adverse effects. The other thing, though, as a public health professional that, that I really want to put a great deal of emphasis on is it's important that people continue to practice the social distancing interventions that we've had in place so far, particularly wearing a mask. Now, first of all, <clears throat> if you've had the vaccine, keep in mind that it's not going to work right away. So that's one reason you need to keep wearing your mask to, to protect yourself and protect others. It's also not going to work as well until you have the second booster dose, and there's a period of time in there. So certainly for that time period and for a little while after, you want to continue to act as if you could you could get the get the infection if you were exposed to COVID. But I would encourage people, even if after they get out of that period, to continue with mask wearing and these other interventions. Uh, you know, the groups that we've talked about in 1A, 1B, and 1C, these are the groups that I think understand COVID the most and have taken it very seriously. And I think we're trying to create a social norm of people wearing masks. I think for the time being, I would encourage everybody just to continue wearing masks, continue to keep your distance, continue to be careful about going into settings where there may be crowds and people that you don't know, because not only does that protect you, but we've got to get everybody through the next six, eight, nine months until people are vaccinated. And that may be the most important intervention that we continue to have in the immediate future. Dr. Fryhofer, any closing thoughts? Well, there's more to come. There are many more vaccine candidates in the pipeline, and hopefully some of the ones coming down won't have to be stored ultra cold like the Pfizer vaccine, which has to be stored at negative 70 degrees, which sort of, sort of limits who can give it. And so hopefully some of these new vaccines that are coming out later will be easier to administer in doctor's offices. Um, Janssen has a viral vector vaccine that they'll likely submit to FDA in late January. It only requires one dose. Uh, AstraZeneca Oxford is also working on a viral vector vaccine that might be ready to submit to FDA in late January, early February. There's some protein-based vaccines under study, including one by Novavax, another by Santa Fe GSK. So there's a lot coming down the pipe. Um, things are progressing rapidly, but I don't think we're sacrificing the safety. But remember, having a vaccine will not end this pandemic if people are not willing to take it. And we have to get vaccine into arms. And we must remember this. Physician recommendation is one of the most effective, effective motivators for vaccination. So if we recommend it, if we get it, I think most of our patients will also get vaccinated. And I can't wait to get vaccinated. I plan to get vaccinated just as soon as I can. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Fryhofer, Dr. Plesha, and Ms. Curtis for being here. There's a lot of information to share about vaccines, and you can find more at the AMA's 
Vaccine Resource Center on the AMA site. That's it for today's COVID-19 update, and it concludes part two of our two-part series. If you missed part one, you can catch that on the AMA's YouTube channel. We'll be back on Monday with a new COVID-19 update. In the meantime, for resources on COVID-19, you can visit ama-assn.org slash COVID-19. Thanks for joining us. Please take care.